We're getting into 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's a long chapter, and we'll be here a few weeks, but it's, it's a beautiful chapter. It's such an exciting chapter. It's the resurrection chapter. So if you uh, follow along with me in your Bibles or on your devices, we're going to look at uh, verses 1 through 11 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. So much that we can glean from uh, this chapter, uh, not only for our life here on earth now, but for our life to come. He talks about what is the body, what is the resurrected body going to be like uh, several, cha- several verses from now, and just an exciting study on what are we going to be like. It's not simply about these disembodied spirits going to heaven forever and ever. There's a a real physical body that we will have when we are raised on that last day. And it's just an exciting reminder to us to remain steadfast and faithful to Him. Uh, Verses 1 through 11 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 goes like this, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand, And by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, that He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though It was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. How about we pray together? Fathers, we uh, begin digesting this chapter, these first 11 verses. I pray that the gospel would shine forth, that the beauty and majesty of Jesus Christ would shine forth, and that any words that are spoken today would be words that come from you, and that we receive them as words from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul says in verse 3, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. You probably remember that that's probably deja vu all over again from what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 during our commemoration of the Holy, uh, of the Holy Communion, where Paul says, that I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. He kind of reverses that. I delivered to you what I also received. And the gospel is something that Paul has delivered to the Corinthians and he delivers to us. But it's not something that he invented out of his mind. It's something that he also received on the road to Damascus. As he says, as one untimely born, a persecutor of the church, not one of the original 12 apostles, but one who was brought into that band by God's grace. Now here in chapter 15, it's the penultimate chapter in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, and essentially it's the final topic that he addresses here. Uh, And this letter has been about correcting errors, doctrinal errors, moral errors, ecclesiastical errors, relational, relational errors. And it's been about helping the Corinthians see that one of their highest priorities in the body of Christ is to live in unity with one another and with Jesus Christ. So here, Paul takes up the issue of resurrection and placing it within the context of this book, he addresses one final issue that may have been a divisive issue among the Corinthian Christians. You recall early on in our study, we had mentioned that because there's such a lot of Jewish terminology in this book, 
more than likely there was probably a high percentage of Jewish Christians in the church in Corinth. Now, in Jesus' day, and of course in Paul's day, there were two sects of Jewish religious leaders. There was the sect of the Pharisees, but there was also the sect of the Sadducees. And those two groups, two parties as it were, they would come together and make up the Jewish council in Jerusalem. Now, we know a lot about the Pharisees. We don't know as much about the Sadducees, but one of the things we know about the Sadducees is that they did not believe in a literal resurrection. And some of these Jewish Christians in Corinth may have been influenced by that, and there may have been some kind of a division in the Corinthian church as to whether or not Jesus actually rose from the dead and whether or not there is such a thing as a resurrection. And Paul clears that up mightily here in these several verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That Jesus actually rose from the dead. And the resurrection is not an allegory. It is a scriptural and spiritual truth. Of course, there are real consequences to what we believe about the resurrection, not only for our doctrinal belief, but for our own destiny. Because if we don't believe in a literal resurrection, then we have a very sad destiny indeed. In fact, we are of all people most to be pitied because we're still in our sins and we will go to hell. So there is a lot at stake here in our belief and understanding of the resurrection. So in restating the gospel here in these first few verses, Paul reminds the Corinthians that the resurrection is an integral part of their total belief system. In fact, resurrection is a key component of their total worldview. And we can say that it's a key component of our worldview as well. In fact, there's no more comprehensive treatment of the resurrection in the Bible than here in 1 Corinthians 15, as we called it, the resurrection chapter. The resurrection is not just the icing of, on the cake of our Christian faith. It lies at the very heart of the good news as the resolution and counterpart to the death of of Jesus Christ or the gospel of the crucifixion. And Paul brings 1 Corinthians essentially to a conclusion with the resurrection of Jesus Christ and we'll explore that reality today, the resurrection as a reality. And we're going to see this key truth. It's this, we believe the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a historical fact and a theological absolute. You might have a couple of extra words there on your outline. Cross them out. It says, we believe the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a historical fact and a theological absolute. Now, if you're a grammatical purist, you might say, an historical fact, but we'll keep it easy. We'll just use the letter A. Historical fact and the theological absolute. It's historical. It's a fact of history because our faith is grounded in documented history. It's not something we just invent out of the air. It is grounded in documented history. And it's a theological absolute. Our faith is given to us by God. It's not invented by man. Therefore, since it's a theological absolute, it is true of everyone who has ever lived. Those who don't believe it, they are the losers. We can't simply dismiss it as just something that's Christian or just something that we believe and you're okay to believe something else. It is an absolute truth. It, it is universal. And those who don't believe in a resurrection of Jesus Christ will die in their sins, will spend eternity in the lake of fire. Guess what? With Satan and his minions. It's a theological 
Absolutely. So this morning we're going to begin our study of the resurrection by looking at four truths about gospel resurrection. And just as we've read, the resurrection is an essential part of the total gospel message proclaimed by Paul and received by the Corinthians. So whenever we talk about the resurrection, we're including the gospel as a whole. He starts this whole chapter with the gospel message. Then he takes that and narrows that down to the resurrection. But he's not pulling that out of the gospel. It's all part of the same message. So let's take a look at four truths about gospel resurrection. The first truth is this. The resurrection is foundational to all faith and life. It's foundational. I like to talk about foundations. I'm a big believer in good, solid foundations. Because I've seen buildings fail because they either didn't have a good foundation or they were not attached to the foundation. But the resurrection is foundational to all faith and life. Look at verses 1 and 2 again with me. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received. He's not introducing a new concept. He preached this gospel to them while he was with them. He's simply reminding them of something that he preached and they also received. And then he says, in which you stand and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word preached to you, Unless you believed in vain. Now indeed all the gospel is foundational. It was preached by Paul. It was received by the Corinthians. It's the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in this gospel all believers stand. Now some people can't stand the gospel. We can't stand without it. But to stand implies that there is something substantial enough upon which to stand. You've all seen pictures of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And maybe you even traveled there to the Leaning Tower of Pisa. It was a bell tower built in the 12th century, beyond, 12th and 13th centuries A.D. And when that tower was being built, it immediately became evident that the ground on, that, on which that tower was being built was not substantial enough to support the weight of this stone tower. And immediately the tower began to lean. And they stopped construction. Several, several years later they reinstituted construction and they tried to make a corrective measure. So if you look closely at the leaning tower, it's actually crooked. It goes like this and then it goes like this a little bit. But even that was leaning. So they built this tower and it just kept leaning and leaning over the centuries. And through those centuries, various measures had been put in place to keep the tower from collapsing or at least to stop its tilt. And in the 1990s, when it reached a critical point, they, they went to the trouble of putting these gigantic lead weights on the upper side to kind of try to tilt it back into place to keep it from leaning further. Well, during that time, they undermined the whole tower and filled that whole thing with concrete so that they could stabilize it, and they were able to finally open it back up to the public. Never underestimate the importance of a solid foundation. The gospel is our solid foundation. If we don't have strong physical foundations, guess what? Buildings fall and tragedies occur. Likewise, if we don't have strong moral, philosophical, and social foundations, lives fall apart, moral and emotional and physical tragedies occur. Worse yet, lives perish in a literal, eternal hell. The importance of a solid foundation. In verses 1 and 2, Paul gives two areas where gospel resurrection is foundational. First of all, it allows us to stand. 
in this life. It gives us the foundation that we can stand in this life. There were these questions going around the Sunday school class today. How do we do this? How do we live in a, in a world that is antagonistic to the gospel and to morality? How do we raise our children in a world that is antagonistic to morality and to the scriptures and to the Christian worldview? We stand on the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how we do it. We stand in this life, but the gospel is also foundational to be saved in the life to come. So when he says in which you are being saved, he's not saying that we're not saved already. He's saying that this salvation that we have experienced will carry us through to eternity to our destination, as long as we stand on this foundation. In verse 19 of this chapter, Paul says that if Christ had not been raised, then we are of all people most to be pitied. And God willing, Pastor Derek will dig into that next week. We're most to be pitied not only because we have nothing upon which to stand in this life, but also because we have nothing that can guarantee our salvation in the life to come. We're still in our sin. But thanks be to God, we have a gospel that is true and that we have a Savior that is trustworthy and we can stand on the gospel today and know that we have a guarantee of our salvation in the life to come. There's another critical aspect of this reality that Paul brings up here in verse 2. He says, if you hold fast to the word that I preached to you. It does require obedience. It requires perseverance. It requires faith. And the only way we can take advantage of the foundational nature of gospel resurrection is to hold fast to it. It's possible to have a very strong foundation, but be blown off simply because we're not attached to that foundation. Uh, there's a picture here. Uh, it was, this is a picture of a house that was ripped off its foundation uh, in a Midwest tornado. Now, I love these kinds of pictures because I like examining what the problem was. Because theoretically, that house should never have remained intact while it was on its foundation. But the whole, ta the whole building remained intact but was blown off the foundation. If you look at some of these, those edges, you see that there was not enough reinforcing in that concrete block to keep that block from falling apart. And apparently there was not enough uh, of, a, uh, of a depth of the anchor bolts in those sole plates keeping that foundation attached to the house or vice versa. And those same things can happen in our lives if we fail to strap ourselves to the foundation of our faith through abiding faith and obedience. What might that look like in our lives? Well, let's say we build our lives on a foundation of temporal things. Things that don't last, things that we know won't last. And yet we build our lives on those things. It's my job. I build my life around my spouse or my children or my friends or my vacation or my retirement or my health. If that's what I'm building my life to and I'm attaching my life to, that foundation will fail because those are all temporary things. Now, not to diminish the importance of those relationships, but what happens then if those relationships, those items are taken from us? Because they can be. Our lives fall apart. But if we're standing firmly on the resurrection and our lives are centered on resurrection truth, and we hold fast to that gospel, then no matter what storms of life may come our way, we will stand. 
just like Jesus said at the very end of Matthew chapter 7, we'll be like that wise person that builds his house on the rock. And even though the storms of life come, the house remains intact. Sometimes I wonder, the churches around the United States and indeed around the world, what are we lashing ourselves to? Are we lashing ourselves to this kind of, some kind of consumer mentality that, that if we only do this, we have flashy uh, videos and we have great, exciting worship services and we have all of the, the, the growth groups that touch every single kind of thing that every human being can possibly endure, that we get together and we have these wonderful experiential moments. If that's what we're lashing ourselves to, look at what's happened over this last year where those things have suddenly gone away and we have churches that are crumbling, caving, and people are still walking away. What about young people, graduates from high school, going off to college and never coming back unless it's for a Father's Day service or a Mother's Day service or a Christmas Eve service? But otherwise, I don't want anything to do with it. Why? Because we lash ourselves to temporal things, temporal relationships, temporal goals instead of lashing ourselves to the gospel of Jesus Christ and teaching our children the same. Well, remember how Job responded to his friends, you know, friends, after his children had been killed. He says this in Job 19, verse 25, and he even goes on, but we'll just cover that verse. For I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will stand upon the earth. We stand upon the gospel. And that gospel tells us that one day Jesus will once again stand upon this earth, judging the deeds of men and women. So the resurrection is a fundamental reality that we must hold fast to. But secondly, the resurrection is scriptural truth. Look at verses 3 and 4. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that, G that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Now, Paul uses this important phrase to legitimize his claims in accordance with the scriptures. He doesn't just throw it out out of the top of his head. It's according to the Scriptures. Now the question is, what Scriptures? Because this book was written somewhere around 55 A.D., and by that time not all of the New Testament had yet been written, and certainly the Corinthians had not had all of the passages of the New Testament that had been written. And this was relatively early on. What Scriptures are they talking about? Well, here specifically he's talking about the Old Testament. Now, later on with the closing of the canon, all Scripture is breathed out by God. But by this time, it was primarily the Old Testament. And they had these ancient writings, which included the Psalms and the prophets. But guess what? They teach the gospel. That's a surprise. I never knew that. I thought it was all about... Uh, God defeating the Canaanites through the Israelites. And it was about the Exodus and about God destroying the world by a global flood. And I thought it was about the Israelites being exiled because they were sinful people. I thought it was about the Lord being my shepherd I shall not want. But guess what? It's the gospel. The gospel is there. Death, burial, resurrection. The gospel is there. In fact, if you take the time to read the Old Testament through the lens of, of the gospel, you will see it all over the place. But these ancient writings taught the gospel to these Corinthians. 
taught them who their Messiah was, taught them what sacrifice means, taught them what bring, be, uh, becoming, uh, getting back to new life or resurrection or coming back from the dead, those things mean. We quoted Job just a minute ago, which points to a resurrection, especially in the verses that follow. And the gospel was attested to long before the actual events occurred. And what does that really mean for us? It means that Paul and the other apostles didn't just invent the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to justify their religion. Sort of a storyline to support the teachings that they're trying to peddle. I don't know if you looked at the back of potato chips lately. But everybody is trying to peddle some story about how their particular product was invented. Back in 1935, Mama Hortensia had a vision to make the best peanut brittle that money can buy. So in the midst of the, of the Great Depression, she, squ- she gathered together her last $150 and bought a peanut boiler and started making these peanut brittle things. And that's why you should buy this product. You ever seen those, some of those weird stories on the back of those potato chips of peanut cans? Well, they, they, they invent stories to justify us buying their product. That's not the gospel. The gospel was not invented by the apostles. The gospel was laid down in Scripture for thousands of years, ever before Jesus came on the scene as an incarnated human being. The apostles, the apostles could have done the same thing. They could have invented a story and passed down oral tradition that nobody really can verify. Nobody knows the facts. No, they didn't. They, they wrote it down, and the prophets wrote these things down in scriptures, not just the good things, but a lot of the bad stuff. And they wrote it down for our benefit so that we can stand on something that is historical and theologically absolute. It's a believable message in part because it's a documented message. Well, the third truth is this. The resurrection is an actual event. It's not merely an an allegory. It was an actual historic event attested to by eyewitnesses. We see that in these next few verses, verses 5 through 8. And because it was attested to by eyewitnesses, we can take this account literally. Now, when we interpret the Bible literally, it doesn't mean we don't recognize there, that there are metaphors in the Bible, right? John, in the, in the very, uh, John the Baptist, in the very beginning of John's gospel, said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, Jesus was being portrayed metaphorically as a lamb. It mean, doesn't mean that he had four legs and a lot of wool, But we recognize it as a metaphor because we take the Bible literally. What does the word literal really mean? According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, it means involving the ordinary or usual meaning of a word, completely true and and accurate, not exaggerated. So when Genesis 1 says day, we say day. Right? That's taking the Bible literally. There is no literal, linguistic, literary justification for seeing anything other than a 24-hour period in Genesis 1 and those series of days. The Oxford English Dictionary says this about literal, taking words in their usual or most basic sense without metaphor or allegory. Not trying to turn literal truth into some kind of metaphor or spiritualism that we can simply dismiss as either your truth or my truth. So the Bible should be interpreted in the plain, normal way that you would translate any other piece of literature. And the words expressed here don't have some mystical or allegorical meaning. They're not figurative. They are literal. So when The Bible says Jesus rose from the dead. Guess what? 
Jesus was dead, now he was alive. Now he's alive. A substantial change physiologically, uh, physically, spiritually, a substantial change has taken place. So when Paul says that Jesus was raised from the dead, we should take it that way. Now Paul, in, in these verses, verses eight through uh, 5 through 8, Paul, he backs up that claim by reporting eyewitness testimony of Jesus walking around after his death and burial. Now there's four groups of people that he mentions. First of all, there's Cephas, or Peter, and the twelve. Now this is the group of twelve was a, the collection of disciples that Jesus originally called apostles. Now, Judas Iscariot was not there. Judas died before the resurrection. So, G Judas Iscariot is not included in this. So, it was actually 11, but this 12 is the body of apostles that were originally called. But then, there's 500 plus random people, verse 6, who saw Jesus walking around and apparently who also knew that he died, they can attest to the fact because he said most of them are still alive. Do some fact-checking. Go investigate for yourselves. Look these people up and find out their testimony. He says some have fallen asleep. That's Paul's euphemism for they died. Jesus uses that euphemism as well and Paul uses that uh, of Christians who have died in the Lord in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But there's 500 plus random people off the street that can attest to the fact that they saw Jesus walking around after the, resurrection, or after the uh, crucifixion. Then he points out James and all the, the apostles. Now these were other people... Uh, James is a half-brother of Jesus who personally saw Jesus and were perhaps those who were sent out by him. Now, an example of this uh, would be Luke chapter 10 where Jesus sends out 72 people, right? The idea of being an apostle is to be sent out. And these were people sent out by Jesus that presumably were not part of the original 12 apostles. And then fourth, there's lastly, Paul himself receiving uh, this vision after Jesus had ascended and resurrection, re uh, resurrected. So we know the resurrection can be taken literally because of Scripture and, of course, because of this eyewitness testimony. But there's a movement today called progressive Christianity. Have you ever heard of progressive Christianity? It's kind of a euphemism for old Protestant liberalism that's been repackaged in postmodern skin. And it's progressive Christianity that increasingly denies the literal resurrection of Jesus and reinvents it as a moral tale, an allegory for finding hope in Christ's message of love to the oppressed in the world. And by moving the resurrection out of the category of literal, actual, historic event, progressives find that they're able then to redefine other moral imperatives in the Bible. So they can redefine things in the Bible like love and morality and justice so that it can be comfortable and so that they can have comfortable scriptures and perhaps a socially conscious religion that alleviates their feelings of guilt. But the problem with that approach is that it guts and disembowels the gospel, takes the power right out of it, such that the good news has no eternal value, and it's no longer good news at all. But if we're going to have any hope any hope in this life or in the life to come, we must accept the scriptural and historic proof about the resurrection 
and trust that God meant what he meant, or that he said what he meant to say. And that what God says, he means to be taken as actual literal truth. Well, number four, the resurrection then is an act of God's grace. Verses 8 through 11, we see this. The resurrection was observed naturally. It was reported literally. But that doesn't mean it can be simply explained as a natural occurrence. The gospel and the resurrection are a supernatural occurrence. The resurrection has to be both literal and supernatural. In fact, it's just as much an act of God's grace as was Paul's calling. Verse 10, he says this, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Paul highlights Jesus' appearance to him in verse 8. And Jesus calling him then to be an apostle, to show that the resurrection was more than just a natural occurrence. First of all, Jesus appeared to Paul after Jesus resurrected and ascended back to heaven. So Paul wasn't one of these people that saw Jesus walking around after the resurrection before the ascension. Paul saw Jesus after the ascension. So he says, as one untimely born, he was overdue, as it were. But Paul saw Jesus. Secondly, Paul is what he is, not by some natural process, not by some human calling, but by the grace of God. And the grace of God is a supernatural mechanism for extending God's favor into the natural world. In contrast to a belief that is in vain if we do not hold fast to the word, verse 2, God's grace toward Paul was not in vain because it energized him to outpace even the other apostles who were called before him. And before Jesus died on the cross, his was a supernatural calling. And it's by that very grace that called Paul that we are also saved. By grace, you have been saved through faith. It's in that grace or by that very grace that we're saved. The, the grace that raised Jesus from the dead, raises us from being dead in our trespasses and sin. See, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a historical fact and a theological absolute. And if we get that down in our minds, it changes then how we live and operate in this world because we live with a grace-filled eternal perspective on all of life, that we can look out onto this temporary world and see it for what it is, just temporary, good things, but temporary things. And we can cling to the eternal things, looking not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporal but the things that are unseen are eternal. Now, what can we do with all of this? Well, whenever you find yourself having to navigate the shifting sands of societal and cult cultural norms, new normals, whenever you're confronted with temptations to, que to question the authority, integrity, or accuracy of the Scriptures, whenever you find people trying to blur the lines between morality and immorality, Look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And let me challenge you to think of the reality of the resurrection and these four truths found in this passage. Now, knowing these truths about the resurrection, what can we do? First of all, we can stand firm in the faith that we've been taught. We can stand firm in the faith that we've been taught because if we have been saved by grace, 
then we are also sustained by grace, supernaturally. And that's how we hold fast. But secondly, we trust the Scriptures as accurate and reliable. Thirdly, we use the Scriptures apologetically. Now, what do I mean apologetically? In defense of the gospel. You can point to passages like this that offer clear proof of a supernatural event. You can, somebody at work or school says, I don't believe Jesus really raised from the dead. Well, you can point to this passage, verses 5 through 8, where it says, there are people that saw Jesus walking around after the crucifixion. So you can use the Scriptures apologetically to defend the faith. And lastly, we should receive biblical teaching humbly. If Paul was humble enough to receive it, and if the Corinthians are humble enough to receive it, shouldn't we also be? Paul considered himself unworthy of being an apostle, yet God called him to be one. And likewise, we are unworthy to be children of God. And yet, guess what? God calls us to be His children. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that You have called us into Your family. Lord, we have received the gospel. We have trusted Jesus Christ. We have confessed our sins and repented of those sins. And we now live new lives. Our spirits have been raised. And we await patiently the bodily resurrection of the dead. Looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, but also the one who sustains us by His grace. Lord, in the spirit of Jesus who has been raised from the dead, and now sits at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. We thank you, and we ask that you would continue to empower us through your Spirit living in us to walk that different path and to lead others to do the same. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray these things. Amen.